Why can't I hold all these copies of Century of Song? That's a, that's a dated meme reference for you all. I hope that a few of you enjoyed it. Hi there, it's me, Noah, author of Century of Song, and we're here for another story time with Polyphonic. In case you haven't been following, Century of Song is my debut book coming out September 17th, and it is a history of American popular music as told through 101 different songs. What I've done is I picked one song for each year from 1923 to 2023 and sort of talked about why that song was important, how it shaped history and culture, and also how it reflected broader things going on in American society. It's a project that I'm really proud of, and if you want to support it, you can pre-order it with the links in the description. Pre-orders are a great way to support stuff because of various ways about how the publishing industry works. Basically, it helps me get on things like bestsellers lists and stuff like that. So if you if you want to pre-order it, I would really appreciate it. A bunch of you already have, so thank you so much for all those. All right, so this week's story time, as you can tell if you clicked on this video, is Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. And this is sort of a bit of an obvious choice, but that's kind of exactly why I decided to pick it for this week. When I first came up with the idea for Century of Song, there were two years that stuck in my head as absolutely immediately like the first night I was lying in bed thinking of it I was like oh these dates for sure one of them was 1965 which is Bob Dylan's like a Rolling Stone and the other one is 1991 which was Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit these were the two that immediately jumped out in my head as turning points in music and 1991 famously is the huge year so let's hear about it <laughs> Few songs have ever captured the spirit and aesthetic of a generation as purely as Smells Like Teen Spirit. In just five minutes of music, Nirvana managed to give voice to the angst, alienation, and reckless abandon of Generation X. Kurt Cobain's raspy shouts and Dave Grohl's thunderous drums hit like a defibrillator, shocking life back into a rock world that was well on its way to flatlining. Overnight, Nirvana went from an underground indie band to a household name and the face of the biggest youth movement since the hippies. They single-handedly shifted the trajectory of rock music in the 90s, and they did it all with nobody, least of all the band, seeing it coming. In the late 80s, mainstream rock had progressed to a point of self-parody. The skin-tight pants and teased-out hair that had once seemed cool and radical were starting to look like exercises in ego and navel-gazing. Huge stadium rock bands were becoming increasingly detached from reality as they traveled on private planes and bought enormous mansions paid for by a booming record industry. The music that had once been synonymous with counterculture had become the epitome of the mainstream industry. But in the underground, a response was starting to simmer. The hardcore punk movement had grown in force throughout the 80s, and a tour by Black Flag helped inspire new regional scenes across the country. Each of these scenes spun off and developed its own unique voice and character. The most distinct of these came out of Seattle. The Seattle sound mixed the loud, political energy of punk rock with the slower, doomy aspects of 70s heavy metal. Such bands as the Melvins, Mudhoney, and Soundgarden stripped away all sheen from their performance. They created a heavy, dirty sound that was appropriately named Grunge. Grunge was just starting to rise when Nirvana came into Seattle from nearby Aberdeen and started to make a name for themselves. They could play just as heavy and loud as any of the other grunge bands, but the brilliant songwriting of Kurt Cobain started to give them an edge. Unlike many in the scene, he was a fan of a lot of pop rock. He adored the Beatles in particular and wrote his songs in the Lennon-McCartney style with simple conceits and approachable, catchy choruses. On their debut album, 1989's Bleach, these pop sensibilities were toned down at the suggestion of Nirvana's independent label, Sub Pop. Sub Pop had been trying to keep the label's sound raw and underground, but this lack of pop sensibilities meant that they were in danger of being bought out by 1990. So Nirvana decided to jump ship and signed with the major label Geffen Records. With a new record deal under their belt, Nirvana teamed up with producer Butch Vig and started to put together a new album, Nevermind. 
This new album also saw the introduction of drummer Dave Grohl, who was one of the loudest ever to sit behind a kit. Grohl and bassist Chris Novoselic had a perfect chemistry, and with a tighter rhythm section, Cobain's guitar and vocals could shine. Vig's production style kept the noise and rage that was essential to Nirvana, but paired it with a crisper studio sound. At just 24 years old, Cobain was still progressing as a songwriter, and never mind saw a newfound maturity enter his lyrics and melody. There was a certain optimism around Nevermind, as Nirvana's clout in the underground was growing, and alt-rock groups like Sonic Youth were starting to gain momentum across the country. Some thought the album might sell 250,000 copies, while the most liberal estimates had it selling half a million copies in a year. Nevermind hit that latter number in two months. A little more than a year after its release, the album was platinum, and by the end of the decade, it had a diamond certification, with over 10 million copies sold in America. The combination of simple pop melodicism and heavy grunge noise made it a perfect entry point for millions of teens who were curious about the underground. Cobain's lyrics were filled with themes of teenage alienation, anti-authoritarian rage, and a deep-seated subtext of mental illness. They spoke to teens raised on Cold War fears and Reaganist propaganda, offering a sort of freedom through rebellion. Nevermind was loaded with hits, but as the opening track, Smells Like Teen Spirit, was foremost among them. Cobain wrote the song as a protest against the apathy of his generation. He sings of a hedonistic party culture in a morose, sardonic tone. Cobain's character is too lazy, too disaffected to care about anything. Even the lyrics cease to interest him in the third verse, which ends with, oh well, whatever, never mind. Cobain felt that many in his generation had been zombified by consumerism. They'd been fed lies their whole life and found themselves entering adulthood with no true purpose or meaning. His music gave them one potential path toward meaning, rebellion against authority. This message is supported by a video that depicts a cohort of bored high school kids rising up and trashing their school as Nirvana wail on their instruments. The entire video is soaked in a yellow haze and reeks of rage and destruction. It has none of the high-budget polish of its contemporaries. Nirvana wear plain shirts and baggy jeans, a grunge fashion trend that would sweep across the nation. The teens Nirvana brought in to shoot the video were genuine fans, and the sheer joy they feel moshing and headbanging comes through. The raw energy of this video made it a favorite on MTV and raised the profile of song. Before long, MTV was pivoting much of its programming to accommodate the underground alternative rock movement that was crawling into the sunlight in the wake of Nirvana's success. Smells Like Teen Spirit earned Kurt Cobain the auspicious title of Voice of a Generation. Like most who are talented enough to receive such a designation, he resented it deeply. For all his pop songwriting, Cobain was ultimately a punk at heart, and a man of the underground. With Nevermind, he suddenly found himself charting higher than Michael Jackson and playing to ravenous audiences of tens of thousands. This unprecedented fame brought with it an enormous pressure that exacerbated Kurt Cobain's lifelong struggle with mental health and addiction. In the end, it brought on a tragic suicide in 1994, when he was just 27 years old. In many ways, Smells Like Teen Spirit is a cautionary tale about the ways that the music industry commodifies talent and leaves its artists on the wayside in the name of ever more money. But it's also a story of human brilliance and artistic genius, about the ways that some artists can tap into a collective unconscious, give voice to millions, and, against all odds, transform the world there you go smells like teen spirit i hope you enjoyed that one this chapter does also have a little honorable mention which exists throughout the book because a lot of years there's more than one song that's important shocker um so i'll, I'll read you that this this honorable mention is losing my religion by rem after enrapturing the underground for much of the 80s the alt rock revolution helped rem rise to the mainstream their biggest hit was Losing My Religion, an understated tune driven by Twinkling Mandolin and Michael Stipe's famous esoteric lyrics. It's paired with a beautiful music video that helped move the video trend away from performances and toward an era of artistic abstraction. All right, thanks for indulging me in another story time with Polyphonic. If you 
liked that and want to read more, um, again, check out the link in the description, pre-order this book. That would help me a lot. And here, I will now, we're close enough to launch. I will give you the full list. Here is my full, the full table of contents. Here is every song that is in the book. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And buy my, buy my book, please. Please buy my book. Please. Bye. My book. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Smells Like Teen Spirit earned Kurt Cobain. Smells Like Teen Spirit earned Co Co Coat Cobain. Smells Like Teen Spirit earned Kurt. Smells Like Teen Spirit earned Coat.